Welcome to The Parlor, the Holy Trinity show headquarters here in British Columbia, Canada. It would probably be easier to list all the players not currently linked with Aston Villa rather than the ones who are. It's an extensive list, and I don't want to talk about that right now because I like dealing in absolute and not rumors that's for another day, but I feel like it's going to be a busy transfer window. What I want to do today is launch a series that I've been looking forward to for a very long time, which is in-depth, long-form conversations with people who I call all-time influential villains. Could be players, could be managers, could be staff, could be many people, and it would be a long list, sort of like the transfer rumors. This series would not be possible without our presenting sponsor, 24-7 Services, and specifically Paul Hansaker, along with Jerry O'Halloran, the Sutton Sports and Social Club, where Emma was pouring bottomless cups of coffee, and the two fine gents, Reese and Tom, of Studio 46 Productions. One thing all these gentlemen have in common is a tremendous amount of pride over their profession and their accomplishments, but also their association with the club. It's like they live by this code to respect others in the job and, of course, the clubs that they end up playing for. Now, these are long conversations, so buckle up. They're an hour or more, and in most cases, that's not enough time. But I want to do this now because none of us are getting any younger, and when these stories are gone, they're gone for good. And what a way to start this series with a chap who only knew Aston Villa as a player and then as fate would have it would return to the club one day and lead them through a wonderful time. This is my conversation with the one and only, the ambassador, the treasure, that is, Brian Little. And I began our conversation by asking whether he thought that he hit the jackpot by being born a Geordie in one of the hotbeds for the game in the United Kingdom. Yeah, I do actually. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm busy writing some children's books at the moment, and and I'm looking at my school photos of of, of of lads I played football with, and I've got one school photograph where five lads played professional football at different levels, and it's at my tiny little school in the in the northeast, and yet five of us went on to play in the football league, which is crazy, really, you know. So, um, yeah, I think that that era was an era where. The, there was certainly a, a lot of talent in the in the northeast of England. Um, I was first scouted by Port Vale, believe it or not, mm. at, the, at the age of 12, 13. And they were managed by Stanley Matthews, Sir Stanley Matthews, who he became. Um, so, you know, that was a great, that, that, that was a massive thing for me, even meeting someone as famous as that when I was a 12, 13 year old. And... Um, it just, it just was the start of what's been an incredible sort of 50 odd years, really. No kidding. Um, so yeah, I, I, but I'm blessed and I, I mean, I'm very much a Geordie person. I still call it home, even though Villa Park and being around Birmingham in the Midlands is, is where I've spent most of my life. But I, you know, I, I only have my young brother in the Northeast now, um, but I still call it home. It's still, I still feel like a Geordie, you know, without... You still have the accent too, yeah. which is I always find. Still got some of it, yeah. They, they call me quite posh when I go home <laughs> now. They'll go, but I do sort of, you do more mood into it sort of thing. You do go back to the, you come out with a bit of slang words and you're thinking, where'd that come from? <laughs> it's still in my brain, you know, so... Well, you lived around the country as well. Yeah. And obviously there are football hotbeds and there would have been back yeah. then. But what, what is it about the Northeast? I mean, all, all the clubs were just so yeah. well supported. Well, I always find now, even when you go to Newcastle now and you, you play against them, even when a Newcastle player kicks the ball out to play, they shout for their ball. It's what war ball? Yeah. It's the war ball. Yeah. You know, so like it's it's crazy. They're just totally fanatical, and they still are about the football in that region. Um, and you know, they're, they're crying out for Sunderland to get a good team together. I'm not so sure I would want that to happen, but. Um, uh, I, I was talking to a fellow called Dennis Stewart the other day who played for Sunderland then ended up at Man City. And uh, he was a great player and a great influence on me. And I, I had to tell him, I've, I've spoken to him loads of time, but I've never had the courage to say, Dennis, do you realise you were one of my heroes when I was a young kid? I saw you playing for Sunderland youth team and you really inspired me because you would just never stopped. You moved all the time. You was thinking all the time. And people, when I was young, because I had long hair and a bit scruffy, didn't think I was thinking enough about football, you know, but I was. I was always, always deep into wanting to be a football player. 
looking at football, thinking about football, sleeping about football. And yet most people thought, oh, he's just a scruffy little so-and-so. He isn't bothered, you know. But I think the two things made it, uh, made it different for me. And I, could, I had that as a little bit of a barrier, you know. So people just think, oh, we'll not talk football to him today. Um, yeah, but I've enjoyed my, my little time. Well, you, you actually, throughout your years in football, you do strike me as a sponge that absorbed yeah. a lot of things. And we'll get into that a little bit later. And I'm assuming you're, you're talking about your youth. First game was at St. James's Park, would it have been? In to, watch, to watch live? No, I actually went to Sunderland because I, I, I'd, moved from, I'd moved from Newcastle down to a place called Peter Lee in County Durham, which I schooled at most of my time. I spent most of my time there. Um, and, and obviously it was just a real Sunderland hotbed. But I went with them, but didn't, I wasn't supporting Sunderland. I went with a few of my friends. And I used to see Dennis Stewart, as I just mentioned, playing in the youth team. Uh, I very rarely got a chance to go to Newcastle. It was too far for us, you know. I mean, we didn't have transport in those days, you know. We had a motorbike and sidecar for a spell, you know. We had, my mum and dad, my dad drove the bike. My mum sat on the back seat and four of us were inside a little sidecar, you know. So it's mm. a, and a dog. So <laughs> we didn't go very far, in all fairness. It's real back to 50s lifestyle you know um, and um, yeah my dad was a miner you know we've, we've come from very humble beginnings but we never wanted for anything you know you know if there was always something on the table even if it was a jam sandwich you know it was that it was there you know my mum was brilliant so uh, yeah all, all my parents a great deal for everything kept me grounded kept us honest um, kept us looking after each other we had a massive family thing about you know family first you don't fight with your family, you fight for them. So it's it's been stuck with me forever. So despite the fact it would have been Roker and not uh, yeah. St. James's Park, uh, did that first, I mean, what you remember of your first, did it have the kind of impression of yeah. live football that yeah. it does for so many kids? How how massive yeah. were, how massive the footballers were. My dad played in a band and he used to do the halftime, you know, the band used to march on. The, so I went, the first game I ever saw was actually at Ayrson Park, Middlesbrough. Ah. Okay. And my dad was, I didn't realise, he said, well, come on, come on, you come to watch a football match, a proper football match. They, they played Liverpool, and that's where I saw Roger Hunt, who was also a massive influence on me, played for England and, and everything. But I first went to watch Middlesbrough versus Liverpool. That's the first professional game I ever saw. And I was, I was in the bandstand, I was standing on my dad's sort of music box and looking over the side. And I remember then thinking, wow. This is brilliant. But how big they were, how, how, how massive. And I was like a tiny little kid thinking, I want to be like them, but look at the size of them. They're huge. Brilliant. I, I have a great memory about it. I write one of my stories is about uh, my, my youngsters, my young day just is based on, on that particular first influence on football. Uh, when I have these kind of talks, I always do ask this question because you do get a variety of answers. But did you in those younger years have some kind of an epiphany or a realization that you know what actually i'm pretty good at this and i think i could have a go yeah i i think wherever whenever i played for my junior teams or anything like that you know people used to always know who i was which was you know you knew that it had got around the schools and you knew that generally speaking there was somebody going to follow you around but i had a younger brother alan who played with me mm -hmm. uh, who played above his age who was hard as nails, I have to say, and he looked after me. You know, I used to say to him, Alan, this lad keeps marking me and kicking me. He said, don't worry, I'll get him, Brian. That's my younger brother looking after me when I was like a kid, you know? So, in fact, Alan joined me at Aston Villa as an apprentice, and he was a year younger than me. But when he came, I really blossomed again. So, but yeah, I, I, I always knew because of the, like everybody knew, everybody knew my nickname, everybody knew all that sort of stuff about me. And, you know, once they started, you just, you got the feeling that, you know, you were doing okay sort of thing, yeah. Obviously, but you mentioned your parents already, how influential your brother, you've talked about heroes that you saw on the park, but was there somebody that without whom you might not have taken that next step to apprenticeship and youth football or? My mum was the most influential person in my life, you know. I, she was the person who, whenever I kicked a ball into a person's garden and they wouldn't give me a ball back, she was round there like a little terrier. You know, <laughs> don't you stop my Brian playing football. And if I was kicking it at the wall against the ball against their wall and they come out and moaned at me, she was out like a little terrier. You leave him alone. He's going to be a footballer, this lad. And it was brilliant. So she was my biggest influence. She never, 
always looked after me. Uh, even when, you know, our last days, you know, I was there with her holding her hand and just, uh, yeah, she was just absolutely incredible for me. It's amazing how many footballers from the era talk about that. You know, yeah. we didn't have much. Yeah. Mom held it together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and it just makes you wonder, mm -hmm. you know, about the current generations, if the same sort of thing. The whole world's changed, hasn't it? You know, and then the whole academy system is brilliant now. So it's an incredible era for, for youngsters to get through. In my day, you know, it, you, it was just... As it was, you played for your school team, end of story. There was nothing else other than that. Um, and school teachers do deserve a pat on the back because nowadays the school teachers don't normally do sports in schools now. Right. You know, you, you have individuals coming in. But in my era, the school teacher was very important, you know, and, and, and kept me all sports. But again, like everything, I was part of everything, basketball team. Athletics team, football team, mm. cricket team, every you know, I was part of it. So you just never stopped really, but it was it was brilliant, really. Did you play in the street too? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. More than anything else. That was the that was the biggest thing. And you know, wherever there was a grass piece, we'd put jackets down and play on it. And, you know, we used to get again shouted at, but my mom would be round like a like a shot if people were moaning at us. But yeah, yeah, yeah. We would I was definitely in that era of in fact, I was one of them singled out with lads who were in the same area. I mean, we'd play one on one, and all our mates would sit and watch us. Well, who's the best player? Because they wanted to find out who was the best player. So I would play against a lad called John Honor, who played for West Brom for a short spell. And uh, he was my main rival. We lived over the road from each other, but we stood, the number of times we had to play 1v1 against each other with all the lads sitting around. And um, whoever won on the day was the best, the best player in the area. So it's all silly little things which you don't see today, unfortunately. But it did cultivate yeah. who you were. Yeah. And this is a question I'm always curious about as a craft player. I was, I was a goalkeeper <laughs> anyway. But you could probably learn how to be clinical through repetition. What, yeah. you, what you're born with is the instinct to know where to be and when. Yes. Do, do you think you had a little bit of that as a, as a clinician in front of goal? I've always enjoyed that. I always enjoyed being in the position where you would score a goal and, always, and never really worried about it. Um, I, I think a lot of people, when they play football and get in them positions, they do the second thing before the first thing. They get that excited. You know, and, 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 and in my, my, my mentality is, you know, wait for him to just commit himself before you do what you do. But lots of people, you know, they see the opportunity, you can see a ball coming to them and they're already thinking about the second touch before they've got the first touch. Yeah. And, and that's clinically completely wrong. So it's always about concentrate, doing the first thing first, second thing second. But you've got to know what the first thing is and the second thing. So many people just think about that second thing, it's going to be a shot. But they've lost it because they're, they haven't got the right process there, you know. I was thinking about that uh, when I watched the second replay again and you score the winning goal yes. on one of those ones where you were lurking. Yeah. And you were lurking in an area where yeah. actually at the time it didn't look like the ball was no. going to get anywhere near no. you. So it was almost like, was it a premonition? Was it a feeling? Did you just have this <laughs> sense? Well, Terry Darricott, who was the, the, the player who left the ball, swears blind I shouted, my ball, leave it or something. I mean, and he said that to <laughs> me for years and years. You, and, and one of my neighbours now, He's a big Everton fan. Always says, "You called for that ball, didn't you? You made him leave that ball for you." But no, it was just—it was a, a, a game that had gone for three massive games, extra time, um, and there was a, a lot of tiredness. And we were renowned under Ron Saunders for our fitness. I mean, he—he he was unique in his um, his way he trained us. He was ahead of his time. I didn't especially get on with him, but he was ahead of his time, and he was good. Um, and we were renowned for being strong at the end of the game. So you're just looking for little pieces. You know, you're always on the move. When you think and you look and you're moving. So, so all the things that were, that were would I, and when I became a coach that I would talk to people about, you know, and, um, you know, looking against a player and how did you beat him last time? What was the best thing you did? You, can't, you necessarily play someone the week after. You don't do the same things. He's a different type of player. So you, all of those things come into being about teaching people. And I taught myself, or I was taught by watching or taught by other coaches. But it's all about passing that on. You know, you might play great one day by backing into somebody, but the next game you back into someone who loves that. Yeah. So you do something different. So we, I've always had that, even I can even from a young kid, and people didn't realize that because of how I looked, I guess, you know. I always wanted to have long hair. So when I left home, 
that was it. You know, my mum and dad had like no say on me. My dad used to tip, march me down at the barbers, short back and sides, his typical sort of tough like Geordie lad, you know? And, um, and I, as soon as I left home, I knew I was going to have long hair. Yeah. I knew it, you know? Um, and that portrayed an image which, which probably protected me in many ways. You know, people used to think, oh, he's not bothered. But mm. I was. Mm -hmm. um, and I was always thinking about it. That uh, was an incredible League Cup to win just because of the fact that it was so protracted. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah. if, if you had to look back on the era, where does that rank, that League Cup win in your career? Well, the League Cup's been special to me, hasn't it? Yeah. You know, I'm one of only three people in its entire history who've, played and won it as a manager and a player of the team. So there's myself, Kenny Dalgleish, and Tony Book from Man City. We're the only three people who've played in the played and won it as a player manager of the same club. So that's I'm very proud of that. Um, and I loved the League Cup and I loved I I I, I really seventy seven we had a, a really good team, 77, you know. 75 was special because we're in the second division mm -hmm. uh, and we won, we won, we won it there. Uh, but 77, um, Andy Gray, John Dean and myself scored 73 goals between us, I think, in the season. So, you know, we were like a real formidable strike force. That was a great period. It was a great... And I, that, that was the one time in my life where... I'd been, I'd played for England 74, 77, I got injured and I never got back in the squad. 77, I, I, I was like genuinely thinking I should be playing for England now. Um, but as the time was, it, it just, you didn't play as many games as England play now. You didn't have get togethers. You didn't have anything right. like that. So there wasn't many games and there were people like Mike Shannon, Kevin Keegan who were established. Uh, Trevor Francis had established himself in the England team then. But I genuinely felt that 77, I am sort of, sort of disappointed that I never got in the England squad again because mm. I think uh, the, the partnership with Andy and Dixie was, was, was phenomenal, really. And I felt I was up there with what was, what was around at the time, but, but disappointing, we never, never got back into the squad. Every once in a while, the hand of fate comes down and brings two things together, in this case, Brian Little and Aston Villa. And I, I guess you wouldn't have been allowed to even go had it not been for Alan coming with you. But mm -hmm. can you take us through how that happened and how quickly you got wind of the fact that you might be moving down to Birmingham? Well, I, I, as I said, the first club I went to was Port Vale. Mm -hmm. And I have a relative called Malcolm Musgrove, who played for West Ham, who was actually assistant manager in 1968 at uh, Aston Villa. And all my family were ringing saying, why is Aston Villa not interested in Brian? He's like playing football, but they didn't have scouts in that area in those days. Um, so I'd been to Port Vale, I started. Uh, I went to Manchester City and Leeds United and, and, and Newcastle Sunderland, of course. But the family phoned Malcolm and said, look, why are you not looking at Brian? So eventually they sent a scout up straight away. He said, oh, come and have a look at him. And, and in fact, send Brian down to, to, to Birmingham. And I was chucked on a train and sent down to Birmingham with by my uncle Malcolm and um, never looked back. From the minute I saw the place, from the minute I went in, from the minute I watched a game, the minute I sat in the corner area next to an old scoreboard, right next to the, the halt end, I was hooked. I just wanted to go there. I just kept thinking, wow. And they were in the second division at that time. Right. Um, and I still had that. The one thing I was a, a little bit aware of, at the age of 15, I didn't even play for Durham Schoolboys or East Durham Schoolboys. So, you know, this, this feeling of how good am I was like knocked a little bit. You know, I had a little, my, my first test of, well, hang on, you're not a county player, but all these other lads are playing for the county. I, I can't go to Manchester City at the moment. I can't go to Leeds. They're right at the top of the tree. Uh, and, and Aston Villa was the perfect place for me. Um, it was in the second division. My uncle was at the time... When I joined, he'd, he'd left, unfortunately. Um, but it was the perfect slot for me. And I, I loved it when I saw it. And all the little bits about it were, was perfect for me. And I had this thing about wanting to leave home as well. I didn't want to play for Newcastle. I didn't want to play for Sunderland. I wanted to stand up on my own two feet. I found that difficult, I have to say. And that's why Alan joined me. 
why? Even though he's a decent, Alan played three or four games for our first team, but he was, um, he was very uh, important for me um, to have him around me, you know, he was, he was a good, and, and, and Douglas, Doug Ellis always tells the story that my mum had said to him, well, you're not getting Brian unless you get Alan. <laughs> so he, and he tells that story. I'm not so sure how true it is, but I know my mum would have encouraged him to take Alan because he would look after me. We, he was very strong for me in those days, very early days. So your mum was an agent as well. Yeah. Handy. <laughs> and, and listen, you talk about 15. I mean, I'm never, ever going to disrespect anybody who goes no. and chases their dreams. But 15, my son turns 15 yeah. in August. There is no I know, chance. I know, I know. And I, wouldn't, I probably wouldn't let him go. So, I, you know, the ratio of excitement and anticipation versus terror, yeah. frankly. Absolutely. Wh where was that? In your well, it... it, it just it just sort of grew up from the age of 13 I was going to football clubs on my own mm. you know and I remember the, when I left home I remember my mum and dad taking me to Durham station and and my dad gave me one pound ten shilling and said here son I can't give you any more but you're going to earn money now so off you go and that that was it you know I, I got down to Birmingham got off the train hadn't got a clue who I was meeting you know, but but I was met by a representative of Aston Villa. Didn't know where I was going, and I met a boy called Roy Stark, who was played for the in the youth team with me, who was in digs with me. Mm. Well, again, I had Roy, who was a, a, a stronger, older type, fifteen year old than I was, um, and I was blessed by having the best landlady in the world, Mr. and Mrs. Mallard, were just fantastic for me. You know, they, they I left, I stayed there till I was twenty one. Just the name Mrs. Mallard for some reason yeah. makes me think she's. Yeah. Uh, she was a good cook, she wasn't brilliant. she? Brilliant. She? Yeah, we used to have beans on toast with cheese on, or cheese on toast with beans on. <laughs> she, she would say to me, Brian, what do you want? You want cheese on toast with beans on, or you want uh, beans on toast with the cheese on? I, that was my stock. I, I lived on that for two years. Yeah, she was oh that good to cook. Yeah, she really was. Uh, but, <laughs> so I lived, I honestly lived on beans on toast, or cheese on toast with beans on, for, t for two years. She was brilliant, you know, in my digs. My first digs. So all the things that just fell into place without you even knowing where you were going or what you were doing. Um, I Today, you wouldn't be allowed to send a 15-year-old out on his own or a 13-year-old out anywhere on his own. Um, but that's how it was. And you you grew up quickly. You know, I from the day I left home, I remember going home after four, five, six months and everybody went, wow, you've changed. And I said, well, I work in an environment with men, you know, and, and it's the workplace is, is where you learn so many things. So you grow up very, very quickly. You see many things that you, you know, which were hard. You know, a lot of footballers in those days were, weren't wealthy guys. They were all under pressure. They all needed to play in the first team. If they weren't in the first team, they were angry, you know, and you were sitting as a young boy, you're sitting in amongst this, you know, and it's, you, you grow up very quickly in that environment at that era, at that time. It, all those things go into place, to be honest. I know there's going to be people, and you had people mm -hmm. in your environment that would have loved to have helped you along, because that is part of being a professional yeah. and mentoring, but there would have been people who yeah. also would have loved to have seen you fail. Yeah. Or I'd love to have seen the young boy go through, you know, tough times. Would you yeah. Would you agree with that? Yeah, to a to a point. I think um, you know you've always got rivalries. You've always got people who you, you're playing. You know, you, they, they might be a teammates, but you, you know if they're in a similar position to you, that then they become. But I've kept. I was. I've been really lucky. I've I've always been all right with people. Me. And I even to this day, I, unfortunately, lost one of my best friends last year, a lad called Bobby Glaze, who was an apprentice when I joined, and he's a Dudley lad. And Bobby and I, for the last 20 years, have met each other every month at IKEA and had a coffee until he passed away last year, you know. So he didn't make it as a footballer. But um, he was a great friend of mine, you know, and he was lovely to me and he looked after me and he always tell me what the fans were thinking about me and, and all sorts of things. And when I was a man, oh, he, so, you know, I, I kept in touch even with people who, you know, didn't make it, but I, they were still my friends to this, to this day, you know. So, and I've been, the fact that I've been at Aston Villa so long, I'm a bit of a sort of the calling card. You know, everybody's, oh, just get in touch with Brian. He'll, he'll, he'll know who to speak to. And so it's, it's like really enhanced my life in many, many ways. But yeah, the, of course there's rivalry to start with. Yeah. But my biggest, my biggest and best thing that ever happened to me was the, the day Frank Upton came as the youth coach. Because he, he 
transferred me from a midfield player to a striker. Why? Because he said I was the best finisher in the group. He said, you, you just make it look easy finishing. And I said, well, I, I, ju I just have a, I just tie, I don't know how, it was like in bread in me, I don't know. But he said, look, you're a good midfield player, but you'll make more, more living out of football if you become a striker or a second striker. So he changed the whole of my path of my career in many ways. I mean, you've transcended the generations through Villa. So even as a coach, you've you've done punditry. Yeah. I mean, could you imagine going up to a U21 or a U18 player and saying, well, you, you need to go and polish all the Watkins boots now and then you need to go sweep the whole ten. Like, do they? No. <laughs> I, I, I'm not. I'm not against that today. I think you know the modern the modern youngster is 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 being brought up in a different way. I love the fact that I cleaned Pat McMahon's boots and Bruce Rioch's boots. I mean, Bruce was one of my heroes. You know, um, he gave him my one of my first jobs in coaching. Um, but but I I love the fact that I cleaned their boots. I felt proud of and and, and you know when I come to Christmas they used to look after me quite well. You know because I'd cleaned their boots well. I don't think it's I, I think the things that we had to do like cleaning the toilets and sweeping the terrace and, and all that it just it 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 was we loved it at the time because we were a group of lads who had a laugh and a joke and and everything. But the eras are changing. You know like youngsters now wouldn't be able to do the things that we couldn't do you know i mean if they were taken away from like all the little fancy toys that they play on now and everything i i just you know we just sat and talked and laughed and joked and went out together and walked together and and, and spent time together they don't do it now i mean i've got you know children and, and they're forever playing games with somebody like 40 mile away or whatever they sit there and i'm like well, yeah. what are you doing oh i'm talking to so-and-so he's in there well you know we were very like it was very personal in my day yeah and, and the whole thing's changed. So I don't question whether it was right or wrong, but I, but I genuinely enjoyed my apprenticeship. Mm. I really did. I enjoyed cleaning people's boots. You, there was the bad jobs, the some days, you know, when you got the, the toilet, worst. the toilet to do. The, worst. That was the, the toilets worst. definitely to do, yeah. The toilets and, and uh, the kit, because the kit, that had to be washed and it stunk, you know, like when you, uh, you this was terrible. <laughs> all the order from the kit and all that. The sweep in the terrace was great, believe it or not, because actually the fans were very generous to us. They used to drop money on the on the floor. You know, we used to collect all the money on, from the whole end. Yeah. And there was a chip shop outside the ground. We used to drop that and we'd halfway through cleaning, we'd go out and buy chips and fish and sit in the whole end eating some dinner together as a group. It's a, it's a real, it was a real coming together as a group of lads. And that group of lads that I worked worked with went on to win the FA Youth Cup so that you know and Aston Villa at the time were a third division football club for the first time in their history but we we sort of started something you know there's five or six of us got into the first team and started to uh, uh, re to revitalize the whole setup at the club in all honesty. In memory serves correct actually you were already you had played for the first team before going and winning the FA yes. Youth Cup so you you would have at some point started thinking okay i want to move on from this to that yeah. uh and did you was there a moment or a game or did some did you start getting the sense that it was imminent that you were going to move yeah. to the first team i think when i got in the team at 17 and when i trained with the first team all the time myself and john gidman were the two players who got the first real and we used to train with the first team at 17 years old and we had an older player called david gibson who was an ex-Leicester City player who you might not recall. But he always, we play, used to play lots of 3v3 three, three three games and Davy Gibson always picked me and John Gidman to play in with him. He was an old school midfield player, clever, tiny little fella, brilliant little player. Mm -hmm. and, and he taught us so much, it was untrue. And he was like a mentor to us as well. But we, we often would win the 3v3 three three tournament with Davy just telling us two what to do and... and uh, because Gidman was a good player, you know. Giddy and I were, we, we got on great together. Um, and David Gibson was fantastic for us. You know, when I signed professional at 17, I still continued my apprenticeship till I was 18. I did all the jobs. Mm. I didn't want to leave the lads. I was part of them and I, I felt it was massively important for me to sweep the terrace and even though I was playing in the first team. You know, I just felt that was the right thing mm. to do. They were my teammates, they were my friends my brother and i didn't feel it was right for me to leave them i was fortunate i got signed at 17 whereas generally speaking it was in that era it was 18 year old at best um but I, so I, I 
kept myself very much on the ground, you know. So, and I think that was just, that's part of my, my, my upbringing from my mum and my dad and the fact that my brother was with me. I didn't want to leave him alone and, and not help. And I didn't want them to think, oh, Billy big time already, you know, sort of thing. With the era... It was a glorious era, slightly before my time, which I only sort of get through the programs yeah. I have. But I mean, imagine if you had the same kind of television coverage you had, you know, today or in yeah. later years. So take us back to the glorious, muddy pitch, <laughs> tough, um, yeah. you know, proper sound coming yeah. out of the ground. So yeah. was it glorious or were we romanticizing it uh, posthumously? It or? was. It was hard work. Because, you know, we'd often play, say, at the baseball ground, which was renowned really yeah. for being sand and, and mud. Even Villa Park wasn't great, you know, I mean, in all fairness. Um, you just got on with it, but in fairness, it had to light your brain up, you know, because when the ball's coming at you, it could hit one of these bubbles or it could slide in the water or it could get stuck in the mm. water. Or, mm. So you had to be thinking about how do I bring this ball down? Whereas today, you know, it's a perfect pass. It's a, it's a great surface. And in fairness, I love the game. I'm not, that's not a criticism. I, I, I can't believe when I see some of the pitches we played on, when I think, you know, we turned up and you got three inches of snow on the pitch. So they just wiped the lines out so you could see the lines and play, you know, it's all of those things, puddles on the pitch where the, the ball was stuck and you'd felt players trying to kick it out of the puddle. All of those things went on in those days. And it, it was a very tough sport in those days. It was very physical. Um, you could virtually, you know, kick lumps out of somebody without the referee. To, I mean, I, the number of times, if you watch, if you go back, you see fights on the pitch and the referee going, now stop it, lads, stop yeah. it, you know, just get on. And then they're not even booked or anything, you know. So it was tough. And and I met, I came across one or two people who genuinely, I could honestly say, frightened me, <laughs> I have to say, and they threatened me. Yeah. You know, they would say things, I'm going to, you, you take that ball, or I'm going to have you, you're going you're gonna to be in bits in a minute. And they mended, you know? Yeah. Uh, and they could do it because they were allowed in that era. So I love the cleaned up football era, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. But I, I still think playing in the rain, playing in the mud, playing in the snow was like brilliant. You know, you had to adapt to something different, you know, and... Um, uh, and it's something that we just did in that era. It's a hypothetical question, but you've, you know, you've prompted it with the pitch discussion. But if there was one modern era creature comfort that you would have loved to have had back in uh, your era, as, you know, as hypothetical as that is, is there, is there one thing now you look at and go, ah, oh, geez, that would have been nice to have had back then? I think just the, the proper facility to, to, to be able to train and play on a good pitch, mm. yeah. especially with the way I played football. I think that would have been in every every day when it when it was muddy and 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 when it was wet and when it was snow and it it even it evened it up a bit you know like the player who was a little more tough and strong and 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 more of a a, a game breaker rather than a game changer they got the advantage out of that so I think today no tackles from behind and stuff like that I think I would have I, that I would have loved that all that sort of thing to have been in an era where I I might have been able to play and you know that i love the modern game i i really do i i marvel at the skill they have and the way they control the ball and the balls coming and then they can use the outside of the boot and bring yeah. it down and yeah i think I, I i think that's i i really really appreciate it. and they work very hard at it you know sometimes um people don't appreciate how talented that is you know and how easy that is for them but how difficult it is actually to do sure so um yeah i think nice pitches that would have been perfect for me. Oh, it speaks tremendously of your character that you didn't immediately see the wages. No, <laughs> I, I've never, uh, yeah. yeah, no, no, <laughs> no. I, well, again, when people say that, I mean, you know, when top managers, they say, what do you like about the game most? Well, I get well paid. I mean, that's, the, you know, honesty, yeah. But at the same time, they would swap a lot of it for, for being involved. I think a lot of the modern players would as well. They, they're very fortunate at the moment. But um, they love it as well, you know, they've got a real love for the game. I don't think a lot of people also appreciate sometimes uh, with the medical advances we've made and <laughs> how bad the injuries were and yeah. what you played with and you particularly. I mean, when, when I'm hearing that you've had your back fused for crying, yeah. that is terrible. Yeah. I mean, how are you feeling these days and do you still have the odd little ache? In well, pain? my knees aren't so good at the moment, my hips. My knees and my hips are the worst, you know. I mean, this knee I had a full replacement on four years ago um, and it hurt. 
yeah. I don't want to have this one done. They've told me I want my left one done, but I don't really want to go through. I think if I really, really had to, like this, if I really, really, really had to, I would. Um, but yeah, I, 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 injuries were, were very much... Uh, well, they were just part of the game in them days. And, you know, I had one of those cruciate uh, injuries, which, you know, those days they couldn't operate on and, and wouldn't operate on. Um, so that finished my career very early. Um, but in many ways, um, where I am today, it wouldn't have been the same story, would it not? I'm not saying I'm, I'm happy that I had to pack in playing at the age of six, 26, but it, it's carved out a, a completely different career, one that I would never have imagined. Um, you know, that here I am sitting here today at 70 year old, having left home at 15, still talking about the club I went to, still working there in a different capacity. I can't think of anybody, and I've been there a long time, who's, who's done as many jobs as I have. I mean, you know, I even worked in the club shop for six months. Mm -hmm. When I had to retire, I wanted a job. So I went to Villa Park and said, can I work in the shop? And they're looking at me as if I was daft. I'm saying, no, I, I just want to be here. You know, I just want to work here. So I worked in the club shop, and, um, and that was the start of many other things. And that club shop opened the, the youth team coach's job for me because I remember Ron Saunders leaving, Tony Barton being given the job, and I walked out the club shop, Tony Barton's walking over the car park, who, he's, and he shouted, because he was a good friend of mine, he was the, the chief scout when I was playing. He said, uh, I'm the manager. They've just given me the manager's job. He said, Keith Leonard's left the youth coach. He said, do you want to be the youth coach? And I swear to God, I, I walked across, I'm walking across the car park, and he said, will you help me? Will you be the youth coach for a few months? I can't guarantee whether you'll get a, the job forever. I said, of course I am. And I, I, so I'd already done coaching badges, but by just being where I was, doing the job I did, it gave me the next line way for me, which was, you know, becoming the youth coach. I did the job for three months and they patted me on the back and said, hey, I tell you what, you're not bad at this. So, and I had a great bunch of lads, Tony Daly, Tony DeRigo, Mark Burke, who's David Norton, Darren Bradley, lots of them, Lee Pale and went on to play league football. Whatever's ha whenever then things happen to me, I think being around Villa Park has probably been the best place for me, really. It's just seemed to open another door for me on, on many, many occasions. This era, though, you know, I'm thinking, I mean, it's one of the greatest music eras, yeah. uh, and you're a pro footballer. I mean, did you, did, first of all, was music a big deal in your I household? Like, yeah. Did you like it as a player? Like, did you ever have an occasion where you bumped into or... Not, not, not so much, no. I, I mean, I, I always liked music, and I, I've been fortunate, uh, you know, I was a bit of a Led Zeppelin fan, and, ah, and I met Robert really? Plant. I've met you Robert. Did. I was with Robert at the Wolves not so long ago, and I've seen him at Wolves oh, over the last five years. I, but this year, I had the courage to go up and say, "Robert, can I have my picture taken with you, please?" I said, "I'm a big fan," and he went, "I'm a fan of you as well, as well, Brian." So that was really good. Wow. Uh, so that, yeah, but yeah, I, and and I've met Rod Stewart at football matches and things like that. Uh, uh, you might not remember, but I did definitely say hello and all that. But yeah, I've always liked sort of rock music, heavy music, free, Black Sabbath, all mm. that sort of stuff. But then I go the other, and I like people like James Taylor. So I love all that old, uh, all the stuff, Carol King, all them sort of things. I have a very varied taste, but mostly sort of 70s sort of music is, is where I still am at sort of thing. You had an interesting relationship with Ron Saunders. Yeah. Uh, on one hand... He did influence your managerial career. You borrowed some things. But on the other, I know that you and many other players uh, were, had your buttons pushed yeah, yeah. occasionally. Yeah. Uh, tell us about how your relationship was and, and how it was those two, sort of two types of things. At the time, you didn't realize it. When I became a football manager, I realized his methods and why he did it, because um, I've seen it on many occasions. He felt by sort of irritating me, it made me better. And he did irritate me. He used to do it all the time to me. Best thing was always used to call me in on a Friday. More often than not, it would be a Friday, the day before a game. And I'd walk in, so I'd say, oh, hi, boss, all right? He said, yeah, sit down. I've just had a phone call about you. And I'd say, oh, okay. He said, yeah, there's a couple of clubs interested in you. And I'd say, oh, that's fine. Well, if, if you need me to go, just tell me. Said, yeah, Rochdale want you. I said, they're in the fourth division. I've just played for England. <laughs> They're in the fourth division. And he said, yeah, well, I'm just telling you, that's the sort of things, the calls I get. So I just, and, he, and I'd walk out in a mood like, like I'm, and that made me like want to play better. But I, I, 
you know, you, but all the lads say, what's going on? I say, I might be going to Rochdale. And like, they're going, what? <laughs> so he, that was his way of more. I know he did similar with Tony Morley, Gary Shaw, all those type of players like that. But the, 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 the infuriating thing for me was like he had his favourites and they stuck out, you know, like, I mean, Big Ken and all the lads, all the centre-halves, all the lads who he knew, like, would, how they would play and they had this set way of playing and they had this set way of, of, of being as consistent as anything um, whereas I suppose myself I don't think I played badly but but the, obviously there's some games that you actually change the game and you you were the, the reason for changing the game and those sort of people he used to think that you know, I've got to motivate him. I've got to make him think a little bit differently. But he didn't have to do that with me. I, I've, I've said it this to you earlier. I, the night before football matches, I would sit there thinking about who I'm playing against. Have I played against him before? Because you didn't know, you know, you didn't see football on TV very much in those days. Even if it was an England international, you'd be thinking, oh, I've not played against him before, but I've not seen him. I've saw a little bit on match of the day, but never anything very much. So you had to, you had to think yourself and motivate yourself. And I don't think he saw that in me. I don't think he realised I had that in me. But he knew he could irritate me. He knew he could wind me up. He knew, and that's what he did with myself, Tony, Gary Shaw, especially so those type of the, the, the main strikers. He always loved his centre forwards. And, uh, but Andy Gray had a problem with it. Andy was a different type of centre forward, very vocal, um, um, very motivated in a different way to, to Ron liked. So Andy was a bit of a problem. But he, he, he loved the honest every day. Not that I was 100%, but he and enjoyed them players. He knew he could trust them players and he didn't have to bother with them. But he, he had strange ways of trying to motivate people like myself. I found out when I became manager, there was, there was different things you needed to say to people. Not necessarily like tricky little things like, oh, you could be going to Rochdale this week mm. and stuff like that. But um, but I, I, I quickly found there was different ways to, 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 to get the best out of different people. And that was basically because of what he'd done to people and as I watched them. Um, some of it I didn't appreciate, but um, I, I realized that was his way, you know, so I, I eventually got over it all. Well, you've kind of answered. First of all, you should have got your hair cut. All those problems. <laughs> with but you, you kind of answered the question there. In that, you probably benefited from a different man management style, didn't yeah. you? you? You probably, not to rebel or be opposite, but you you probably changed the way you did approach yeah. the man management side. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I use that saying, treat people the way you like to be treated yourself. It worked for me. I, I think I could never have been anyone who was like, you know, bawling and shouting at people and because they would have just laughed at me in all fairness. It's still the hardest thing in the world, picking a football team, when you know you're leaving good players out of the team, especially at the level when I got to Leicester and Aston Villa and things like that. Um, you're leaving good players out of the team and, and the good players want to play football. It, it, it's changed a little bit again now. They appreciate, and the, the way they're brought up in academies, they're taught about having time on and time off and changing and rotation and all this sort of thing. Back in my era, uh, when I was manager at Aston Villa, everybody wanted to play, you know, and I, I had issues when I had like people like Steve Staunton, who was the most capped player for the Republic of Ireland, who Steve was often on the bench for me, you know, and that's a hard decision because you're thinking, you know, that, that, that he wants to play, he needs to play. We've still had that in our, in our system at that time. Tommy Johnson, who was one of my favourite players ever, who I signed. And Tommy, you know, I was hardly in the... T he used to come on as a sub all the time, but was the best sub in the world because he, he never moaned, never groaned and wanted to be on the pitch. He'd be running past me, warming up, going, can, can I go on now? I want to play now. And I was just saying, Tommy, just give it a little bit longer, you know. But he, I loved that side of it, but he's still... I felt when I retired from football management, I retired because I didn't enjoy picking the team yeah. anymore. I didn't enjoy leaving people out. And I, 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 I sort of lost that ruthlessness of, well, I don't care. I've got to, this is my team. This is what's in my head. That's what I'm going to do. And I found that sometimes I got to the point where I said, I'll just play him today because I don't really need yeah, him, you know? Yeah. So I, I, that, that's when I realised that it was time. And I'd done 902 games as a manager and I'd worked in six different divisions. I felt that it was time to sort of say, right, that you've done it now. 
because people always still ask me now, wouldn't you, you not want to do it again? I'm going, no, I don't. Mm. You know, I knew, I, I know my time was up and I, I really enjoy what I do now, ambassadorial stuff. I enjoyed working for the TV for a couple of years. I did mm -hmm. a bit of that. Um, but again, I found punditry not what I wanted to do in the end. Um, I don't really want to be the person who's telling somebody he should have scored a goal and all when he when he's I know he's tried. Yeah. And I know he's tried his best. I didn't really enjoy that side too much. It's funny how uh ex pros who go on to become managers, it's not often that you have the elite player become the manager. Oftentimes it's the player that had to work a little harder, yeah. learn a little bit more. Yeah. You're the exception there because the game did come so naturally to you. And sometimes, you know, the elite players couldn't explain to their players what to do because yeah. they just knew it. So how did you find that progression? It sounded like it was pretty natural. I've always got on with people. If I don't, if I don't get on with somebody, I really don't need to, to bother with them too much. I, I'd either keep out of the way or just let them do what I, I don't. But I've always been able to get on with people, always communicated well with people, always talked on the pitch. People would have thought I wasn't a talker on the pitch, mm. but I was. You know, I, I, I used to be, I could see the game playing and, and as it was panning out. Um, and I always felt that talking was the most important thing. Um, I, I think when I got that youth coach's job, I realized that, wow, all right, so I've had to pack in, but I've got something in the locker here. I, it, it, again, it, it, it just sent the juices sort of bubbling a little bit and thinking, no, I can do this. Mm. You know, and, I, and when I'd done three years at Villa and I went to go to Wolves and I had a very short spell as a caretaker manager there, I had seven games. I, I even felt, in, and I'd, I'd won my last two games, and then this, they'd sacked me, they wanted someone in more who'd been, been a manager for some time. When I went to work with Bruce Rioch at, uh, at Middlesbrough, I always said to Bruce, Bruce, look, I've had a little taste of management. That's what I really want to do at some stage. Um, and Bruce was brilliant with me teaching things, but I always felt I could do well as a manager. Mm. Um, and I was looking forward to the day that I became a manager. Um, but my first job was at Darlington, mm. and um, we got relegated. Yeah. I, was, I was given the job two months from the end of the season when they were bottom of the league anyway, um, and, that, and that was a, an experience. But, you know, I'd nearly almost kept them up, but didn't. In fact, that was the day, uh, if a chairman ever said a good word to me in, in my life, that was the day the chairman, Richard Corden was his name, called me out of the dressing room. We'd just been relegated at Scunthorpe, called me out of the dressing room and said, I need to see you on the pitch. And I thought, right, that's it, I'm sacked. And he went, I tell you what, Brian, if you leave, I'm leaving tomorrow as well. And I looked at him, I said, what do you mean? He said, look, I'm gonna give you two years and I'm gonna give myself two years. If we're not promoted back into the Football League in two years, both of us are finished, but if you leave, I'm leaving. That's the best thing ever, ever anybody's ever said to me in my life, you know? And then look what happened. Yeah, we won two championships two years in a row. And, and, and I think there's not enough made of that, by the no. way, just because I, I'm thinking about what, what on earth kind of resources do you have to no. scout, to sign, yeah. to entice? How did you do it? Well, the simple fact is when, when I worked with Bruce Rioch, he used to we used to go scouting all the time because we were in digs up there to start with. We used to go watching football matches and he, he, he educated me on you know, players at different levels and stuff like that. And I had a real, at Darlington, when we got relegated, there was 19 players out of contract of the 23 players at the club. I released the whole 19 and signed 16 new players. Wow. And, and, and that was all done in the space of two weeks. And the next two weeks, we, we put together a squad which won two championships. It was amazing. But it was because of my background of, of looking at players. I'd been a youth coach. I signed people who I'd seen playing in youth teams who developed into first team players. I'd seen players who I'd watched play, you know, while I was scouting and watching other games. I was always thinking, oh, God, someday I'll have it. I'll, you know, and then even when I was a manager, sometimes you'd see a player on the opposition team who played well and you'd just go up and say, whoa, well played today. Just so as he knows that you think he's played well. Gareth Southgate. Yeah. Uh, yeah and, and, then, and then eventually, you know, you, you, you get a call saying, oh, Brian, Lowe's been interested. Oh, well, he said that. He said that nice to me. So it's not tapping people up. It's just letting people know that you appreciate that they're a decent player. Um, I signed Simon Grayson. You might not know Simon. but yeah, I don't know. But Simon was playing in a Leeds United youth team with people like Gary Speed and all those players who were real top-notches. 
And out of all of this thing, I remember I could hear this midfield player shouting at everybody, telling them what to do. And I'm looking, I'm thinking, who's he? And his name was Simon Grayson. And I watched him a couple of times. When I got the Leicester job, first person I signed, Simon Grayson. Not in the first team, but I just I liked what I saw and what you and I just thought I want him here. So all the little things that uh, being at games, watching games, um, having the right sort of people around you was very important to me. And and building a team um, based on how Ron Saunders built a team. This was my. And this is where I, I found out that I respected Saunders. Well, yeah, let's talk about that. Because yeah. structurally, you were very specific about yeah. what you wanted. What was that structure? What was the identity? Because that would continue on at Villa years later yeah. as well. Well, Ron Saunders' teams had a, a mix that produced a pedigree. Mm. You know, and yet hardly any of them were international players. But they all, they all did the functions that he felt that they needed to do. You know, he had a Des Bremner. Before Des, he would have a Frank Caradus, who was the player that could, oh, he was all over the place. You couldn't stop them running. That great energy, great enthusiasm, brilliant in the team. That had Dennis Mortimer, mm. you know, a captain, someone who could lead from the middle, run with the ball. Then they'd have a little Sid Cowens, you know. And I tried to replicate all of these, all of these strengths that these people had. Wherever, whichever club I went to, whether it be Darlington and they're in the lower division, I still looked for the best sort of Gordon Cowan's type player who, at that level. Then I looked for the best Dennis Mortimer type of player at that level. Then I'd look for the right, the right side of, of Des Bremner sort of player. So I built a Ron Saunders team, albeit not the same talent, depending on where you were, but all had the same ingredients that he put into a team. Mm -hmm. His two centre-backs were always like strong and, and never gave up. And Alan Evans and Ken McNaught were outrageous. Mm -hmm. Ever was my best pal or was my best pal for years and I don't see him so much now. Kenny Swain, you know, I played striker with Kenny. Kenny Swain was a striker when he came to build. Played him right back. He'd, found, he'd, he'd identified he was going to be a good right back. And how did he do that? And, and all of these things. And he always seemed to have a right-footed centre-forward and a left-footed centre-forward. Peter with Gary Shaw, Brian Little, Andy Gray. And I built that sort of thing in my teams as well. When I was successful as a manager, whether it be Darlington, Leicester, Tranmere, Villa, wherever, that I produced a Ron Saunders-type team. Mm. When I couldn't produce that type of team, that's when you, I found myself under pressure. He, he was a massive influence on me. Um, because he, he, he and Tony Barton, who was his scout, identified people to play alongside each other. They never thought of, well, we're going to have the three best midfield players in the world who all play the same, but they're in the same team. No. He didn't want that. Complimentary. He, he wanted them to complement each other. And I, I, I see the game, you know, all right, today I'm not, so, I'm not so sure whether it's, you know, you have to have the best players and, and they do, the, the, the more educated now than they ever were in those days. But back in the era I played, building a Ron Saunders team for me was massively important. And it gave me, uh, you know, loads of success, you know, because I, I took teams into playoffs at the lower leagues. I won the lower leagues. Um, I've been in the playoff finals at different clubs at different times. Um, and then won my major one with Villa, obviously, with my Ron Saunders team. Ian Taylor was my Des Bremner, you know. Mm. You know, uh, Andy Townsend was my my Dennis Mortimer. Mark Draper was my Gordon Cowens. Yeah. Dwight York and Savo Milosevic, my right foot and left footed centre forwards. It just matches perfect, yeah. just absolutely perfect. And um, yeah, I owed him a lot for that. Um, to try to tell him at once, but he wouldn't listen. <laughs> And that brings us to the hand of fate reaching out. You'd built your profile and your resume and you were to once again be reunited with Aston Villa via Doug Ellis. And I, I know it would have been a different time and difficult, you know, with what was happening at Filbert Street at the time. But how much did familiarity and also the scale of Aston Villa sort of tip your decision in that, in that direction? Well, I have to say I was at first a little bit nervous about it. I... Um I, as a player, had, I don't think I'd ever booed in my life, you know, I mean, I, at Villa Park. I can't ever remember a fan come up and say, you were rubbish today or anything like that. I mean, it just never happened. Um, and here I am in a, in a position where I know now that Aston Villa are thinking about me being the manager. And I know that Ron Atkinson was a brilliant manager. And I know that they were struggling. I knew they were fourth off bottom in the, in the Premier League. And I'm thinking... 
great job. Is it the right time? And I, I really had to sit down and think, will I get steak? Do I want to damage the relationship I have with myself and the, the fans? And I, I, I really had to sit down, in, in fairness. Um, and then, of course, John Gregory, my, one of my best friends who worked with me and Alan Evans. Um, John said, what are you thinking? I said, I'm not sure, John. I said, I, obviously, I want to do it, but is it the right time? And he said to me, just looked at me and said, you might not get asked again. Mm. Might not ever get asked again. So do it. And that was the most, it was a, you know, from someone who, who it's not directly affecting, it was easy for him to sort of say, you might not ever get asked again. Yeah. And he was right. So that really swung the whole thing around. And um, it took John to give me that sentence to, to really, I, I, was, I was a bit nervous about it. I was, honestly, I have to say, I'd love my time at Leicester. I had three great years. We'd been in the playoff final three years in a row, managed to take them to the Premier League, which is unheard of three years in a row. But yes, we were struggling in the Premier League because we weren't a big, a big outfit. But, but we weren't any worse off than, than Aston Villa at the time. Um, but, but John's sentence and then sitting down together and believing we could do something, John Allen and myself, um, just went, yeah, we've got to do it. So I just reported to the board straight away and I went up and said, look, you know, you've got to let me go. I can't, uh, I can't miss this opportunity. They weren't happy. Yeah. Um, and they sort of pretended they were going to take me to court and things like that. So it got a bit messy. But it all turned out right in the end. Um, John and I were given permission to leave. They kept Allen for one game. <laughs> he played Arsenal and beat them. So he's got a 100% record so, uh, as the manager of yeah. Leicester City, you know, so, uh, which is something you can't take away from. But, but yeah, it was very traumatic because, I mean, I got a lot of bad press at the time and I never had bad press or I'd never had bad press till that moment, you know, and I got all this Judas thing that fans do and, and, yeah. and even the Sun newspaper had me on the front page, Judas, <laughs> which is like... You know, you wake up and your wife and your two little boys and things like that, and you're looking at it and they're going, my dad's on the front page of the, oh. the paper and I've got to go to school on Monday, you know, and he's calling him Judas. Right. And like, it's not nice, you know? No, but take me through yeah. the first negotiation for the managerial position with Doug Ellis. I can only imagine what that must have looked well, like. Well, I got a lot the... less than what I asked for. Oh, wow. I can't... That is a certain, you know, I, that, that became sort of the norm with Doug when I got used to him. The thing about football at that time, it was the chairman and the manager who did all the negotiations for, for, for signings, for everything. We didn't have, you know, uh, uh, sporting directors or anything like that. So it was, so pretty much I answered to only one person, and that's the chairman, and that was it. You know, he and I decided where, where we went and what we did. When we first met, we talked about um, the team, the current Villa team, which had some fabulous players, players with great experience who'd been around. But perhaps it was the time for them to be moving on and changing a little bit so from day one it was the conversation was about trying to to build this new type of team um but that would mean that a lot of senior players who were very influential in the dressing room would would probably move on and um i think you know initially i had a really great response and, and so I, I up until christmas and in january in January, I'm on one manager of the month. So we went from fourth off bottom to 10th off top or ninth off top in the, in the Premier League. Then February, when it all kicked in, when all of the agents were getting in touch with us saying, what are you doing with so-and-so at the end of the season? Or, Would he be able to go now? And all this sort of thing. So all of those conversations came through me, not anyone else, you know. So right. I had agents of, of Dean Saunders, Dalian Atkinson, Kevin Richardson, Ray, Ray Houghton, all of these big name players who I was saying, well, look, I mean, it, it, you know, if, if there's an offer there, then I, I'm going to have to consider it because I want to try and change the thing. And that then really made the last two, three months of the season very difficult for me because especially Dalian and, and Dean Saunders, Dalian, God bless him, um, they knew that they had opportunities to go to Fen Fenerbahce and Galatasaray. Um, and then they knew that I'd given their agent permission to sort it out for the end of the season. So you lose a little... Yeah. Five percent, maybe. Yeah. 
Yeah. And 5% of a good player is a lot, you know? Mm. Uh, and I'm not, not accusing them of giving in or anything. I think it's definitely not. But they've got a, f a different yeah. focus. Yeah. They've got a completely different focus now. And that happened to a lot of players. And then in that era there, you know, you could still do a transfer in, until the third Friday, Thursday in March. So right. I sold a lot of the players before the end of the transfer deadline. So there was a massive change around. And people like Tommy Johnson was coming in, Gary Charles, Ian Taylor, none of whom were like household names like the guys who were, were there. Um, and, and people were beginning to think, what's going on here, you know? So I have to say, when, when we got to the last game of the season and we weren't relegated, from February, April, May, I think was went down the league quite strongly. We lost games that we should have won. Um, and, and it began to get a little bit tetchy. But, but the fact that we survived... And it was, you know, the last game of the season, we, um, Crystal Palace lost at Newcastle, so they weren't going to clear us anyway. Um, but it, during that period, I was, that time, looking and thinking about Ron Saunders' teams, Ron Saunders' yeah. teams, here we go. And I was looking for players. Mm -hmm. And I remember one of the games we played was against Crystal Palace. And Gareth played midfield that day mm -hmm. and scored two goals. And straight away, I remember thinking, I'm going to sign him. He's one of the ones I want. Um, so I, I identified people from from again seeing them them play against us as well as because I was beginning to learn about the Premier League and learn a lot more than I knew. Um, but but in, by in the main, most of the lads who joined weren't like household names, you know. Um, you know, a Draper who had been at Notts County before I took him to, to Leicester. You know, people were thinking, well, yeah, he's played for Leicester, but they've just got relegated. You know what I mean? What about this? Uh, but I had a lot of faith in in Bosnich, McGrath, mm -hmm. Hugo Ekio, again, God rest his soul, Andy Townsend, and Dwight, who I straight away took to Dwight. I saw something in him that some other people could, because Dwight would play on, right, on the right wing sometimes, he'd play midfield. Nobody really identified which was his best position, but straight away he was a me. You know, like I, I was thinking, like, well, all I need is a left-footed Andy Gray type centre forward uh, and I've got the partnership. So Dwight became me, you know, or Gary Shaw. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted that left-footed centre forward and I looked high and wide and then one day I, an agent sent me a video of a lad called Savo Milosevic. <laughs> and I went, well, where's he? And he says, he pays for parties and Belgrade. I'm going, well, I've not seen them play ever. you know. So I started watching this video and I'm thinking, you know, there's something about this lad. He's strong, he's young, he's 21 years old. He's playing for the Yugoslavian national team. Um, and I tried to find out who would have seen him play. So I spoke to Terry Venables, who everybody would have held in high esteem in terms of, you know, coaching and scouting. And, and he said, I've seen him, Brian, he's decent. And I, so I said, I, re I remember going into Doug's office and said, I found my centre forward. He said, who is he? I said, lad called Savo Milosevic from Partizan Belgrade. You know, Doug's answer wasn't, oh, great. He went, I've never been to Belgrade, so let's go. <laughs> so I'd, so I'd, I'd found a place that he'd never been to. And then when we got on the aeroplane, he said, you know we're going into a war zone, don't you? And I went, no. I haven't looked at that at all. I'm just a football manager. So it was, um, and that, that whole team really, really morphed itself together at the end of that season. Mm. Um, you know, uh, Southgate signed, Draper signed, Alan Wright signed for me. It was a, a good, uh, people, when I signed Alan Wright, they're going, you've got Steve Staunton. And that was probably one of my biggest uh, testing things because um, Stan was a great player. Um, and he often would, play left back or even centre back for me and Alan Wright always seemed to play and people say why are you playing Alan Wright mm. I kept saying because we're winning games and and you know much about Ron Saunders thing in me he, well, I've got this this thing just works together these people work together um, and I always get embarrassed or, or nervous when I'm with Steve Stone because I, 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 I genuinely can't believe I left him out of the team a few times because he was such a good player he was a great player yeah um but that's one of the decisions that as a manager you would make. And, and if your head's clear and your mind's clear and everything, you just do it. You know, you say, look, this is my decision. I'm prepared to rest my case on that decision. In no time at all, we played pre-season. And I knew Gareth had played midfield. And I was playing in midfield in a couple of the pre-season games. 
And then for whatever reason, we put him back as a, as a centre-back just because he was a defensive sort, more of a defensive midfield player. And Alan Evans and Joe Gregory and myself just looked at each other and went, whoa, we found somebody who reads the game so well. And McGrath by that time was, you know, running a, a little bit on, on a low fueled tank, if that sounds right, yeah, if that's yeah. the way. But he was still great, still brave, still the best, but, but got tired. So we decided to play with a three, with, with Hugo on one side um, and Gareth on the other side, to protect him a little bit. But he was still like, still, I, I, you can't, I can't think of a word. I mean, people come out with God and things like that to, to express him. But until you've worked with him, you can't explain how someone who couldn't walk in the week you played on a Saturday. Yeah. You know, I, I still to this day, Jim Walker, especially so, who I, I, I know you've spoken to, Jim was incredible. Um, Jim was like, we're a massive father to a father figure who looked after him. Paul really didn't even eat with the players before a game. You know, he was that nervous or built up and, and worried about the game. And so many things that Jim kept him on, on the right tracks with. Gareth happened to fall back and Andy Townsend kept that slot in the middle and Andy was a great leader. I didn't realise how influential Townsend was in the dressing room until he was the captain of that second season. He took the mickey more than anyone else, but at the same time then was as serious as anyone else when, it when the time was right. He would rollick somebody if he needed to, you know? He would be laughing and joking and so sorting all the daft things out. And he had a few daft lads because Draper was crazy, you know, and Ian Taylor and Tommy Johnson. They were like, honestly, three comedians for me. They were yeah. brilliant, um, but, but focused on wanting to play at the right time. It was a brilliant dressing room. Sometimes you can buy someone who you think is the right player and he doesn't somehow mix with it. Yeah. But that, I got all those ingredients. I can't, I, I have to say that, you know, if, if you were making the best cake in the world, I'd, I'd made the best cake in the world. It was brilliant. For the me. names you're rattling off yeah. there are incredible. I mean, did you ever find it difficult to manage personalities? I mean, the one after another, all those names you're giving there. I think the, the first bunch were, were, they loved Ron Atkinson. And I, I fully appreciated that. You know, Dean and, and all of the lads loved Ron Atkinson. And, and yeah. you know, I've spoken to Ron on many, many occasions. He's a massive personality. He's a great person. And here comes little old me in there to follow him you know which is completely the opposite i got through that period because i knew i needed to change a few things and i looked after every single one of the lads that left you know they all got the right deal uh sean teal who i still speak to now sean great lad but i got a, I, I i said i was honest with sean i said look i'm buying some other people um tranmere it was and I, I said, I know Tranmere are willing to give you a three-year deal. I'll offer you a one-year deal if you want. So I was as honest as I mm. could be. Mm. So I was always, I always felt that honesty and that integrity was was right, you know. So and and Sean decided he'd, he'd go for the pension, you know, the, the three. He didn't want to be a sub, which yeah. is the right thing to say. But he was brilliant as well to me, Sean Teal, because he and McGrath were were a real legendary sort of pairing before I got there. I was right at the right place at the right time in my career then. I was flying, you know, I'd just been in three playoff finals. I'd won two championships with Darlington. I think of, of all my seasons in football, 77 as a player was the best. But as a football manager, 96 was just brilliant. You're part of the fabric of the club, Brian. So what do you make of what's happening now? I love it. I think yeah. it's brilliant. In this modern era now, to have taken a team from fourth off bottom to fourth off top in 12 or 15 months or what is just... It's just outrageous in the modern game. And and a lot of the lads are the a lot of the lads who were there before, you know. He's yeah. he's he's um organized, motivated, he's tactically great. I think it's it's great watching him. I I, I sometimes try and think, oh, I wonder what Unai's gonna do today, and he does exactly the opposite to me. And I'm thinking, why why he's, he's just so I can't work out, you know, sometimes and and what I love about him, I know the modern game allows you to do it, but it's like you know, I, I remember being at Middlesbrough and places like that this year, you know, and it's nil-nil with 10 minutes to go on. And he's got four subs lined up on the sideline. You're going, oh, we're, we're going to win. Somehow you just believe you're yeah. going to win. And somehow the lads believe they're going to win. Yeah. And he's got them all accepting it and understanding it and why he's doing it. And, um, and in, in, in my era, it was about team spirit, being together, 
um, not knowing a great deal about the opposite. Nowadays, when you've got to analyse everything and, and teach the lads, because they're brought up to be taught what the, you want them to do, how you want them to play, they will play to that particular way. In my era, I had a team that I enjoyed and I could let them play. I knew they would play. Now, he has to be tactically aware, yeah. playing different teams who play different ways. And um, I take my hat off to Unai, I really do. I think he's, uh, I think it's incredible what he's done. Long may it continue. And I think it's really lightened up, brightened up. You watch the players who've initially found it difficult to slow the game down and pass. Even the fans found it difficult uh, to slow. Initially they yeah, did. They did yeah. find that difficult. But now they understand that. They're, they're looking for the right opportunity to go. Yeah. And the players accept that and understand that. And I don't think you can say he's got it wrong. I mean, in the modern game, you're going to have a game or two that you you like, oh, it hasn't quite worked today. Um, but they've been so far and few between. To be in that top four in the Premier League at this moment in time, when you think how vast the game is and how big it is and how big the good clubs are and, and, and stuff like that, it's, it's, real, it's a real achievement. Um, but it's an achievement that will be harder to maintain. You know, It's not going to be an easy road to maintain it, but well, he seems to have the right mindset for it all. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just take my hat off to him. I think he's brilliant. Brian, I'm going to finish up by pressing you high and hard now. So I'm going to rapid fire pepper you right. with questions. So you need to be quick and nimble and I'll ready to react. I'm not good at that. Just like <laughs> in 1977 at Old Trafford, you were ready okay. and quick to react. So I'm going to throw these at you quickly. Here we go. Better ground, Filbert Street or the King Power Stadium? Filbert Street. The correct answer. Worst ground you've ever experienced as Leeds. a pro? Leeds. Favourite goal scored of all time of yours? Man City, League Cup, 77 winning team. Flicked it through my legs and just side put it in the corner. You, uh, the cultured one. The yeah, one. I, I never blasted anyone. Yeah. <laughs> Chris Nickel played in a bed, God bless, please, Chris, one of my best pals. Played a ball into me in the box, I just knocked it through my legs, turned the fella inside out and just slotted it in the corner. Favourite goal ever? Better feeling, winning as a player or winning as a manager? Manager. Your favourite car, either as a player or a manager? My uh, first sports car, MGB GT. Your favourite indulgent purchase as a player? Well, again, it'd be a car, wouldn't it? I think I, I remember buying it. I bought a BMW 8 Series. It cost me an absolute fortune. And I said at the time I had cash, so I paid for it as well. Yeah, my BMW 8 Series, 1998 it would have been. It was the old Wedge one. It's a really iconic uh, car now. I thought you were going to say bell bottoms and platform shoes. But I'm into them as well, yeah. <laughs> Little known hidden talent of Brian Little. I'm really good at uh, Spider Solitaire. Mm. That's the only thing I can play on a computer. My, my, my lads have bought me a computer. I play Spider Solitaire on it all the time. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm really good at it. I'm sorry, but the correct answer was driving. <laughs> You're an excellent driver. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. And Mr. Ellis told me that <laughs> once, of course. Name a player you came oh so close to signing, but for whatever reason it fell through. We had Les Ferdinand at Villa Park and didn't have him. Missed out. He was going to go to Newcastle anyway. But oh. Les Ferdinand. Wow. That's who we, we invited down and spoke to him, but he was already signed and see. He came to us out of out of that, but Les Ferdinand, yeah. What about a player that you're very thankful did not end up signing for you that you might have had on the line? This is a terrible question. That, that, yeah, that's, that's hard. <laughs> Doug invited Danny Blind from Ajax oh. to come and talk to us. But we were never going to sign him and it was the most embarrassing day in my life because he's like, I mean, Danny Blind thought he was coming here to sign for us and, um, and uh, Doug just wanted to meet him because he like, was fascinated with the, with the captain of Ajax and the captain of... And I remember I was like so embarrassed. I was saying, but we're not signing him. Oh, it doesn't matter. And I'm like, oh, please. You managed them in 07 and 08. So have you watched Welcome to Wrexham? No. Well, it's a story about yeah, Canadians I, I, doing good yeah, things. I, I know. Lands. I think it was such a bad time in my life that I didn't enjoy it at all. So it doesn't swim with me. The most famous person in your current cell phone contacts. 
I would think the fact that I've I've spoken to Robert Plant lately. Yeah. I haven't got his number, but I know where he is. You know, and he has invited me to one of his sort of uh, gigs, so I'm quite looking forward to that, to be honest. And the last television show that you binged watched? My wife loves all of these the dramas and everything, but I'm. I have my own room where I just sit and watch sport all the time. I, I'm snooker, cricket, hmm. racing. Oh, I love watching horse racing on the TV. Anything to do with sport, I'm sorry, but I, I just, that is me. I don't go beyond anything but sport. I, I think you'd enjoy Gentlemen, though. I'm not trying to pump a Netflix show, but there's Guy Ritchie, very good. Oh, really? Very good. I see, I do, just go straight <laughs> my head. <laughs> Brian, what a pleasure. Thank not you. Not many people get a chance to sit and do this, uh, and I will say on behalf of all Villa fans, thank you thank as a player, as a manager, for being one of the all-time influential villains. Thank you very much. for doing this. Very kind of you. Thank you.